Some of you may remember Peter Wells from uh, previous um, X Worlds. Um, you may also remember him for some of the podcasts that he's been on or some of his articles in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, Pete's a desktop analyst currently working with UNSW Australia and he's also a technology commentator. Um, this is Pete's third time presenting at X-World, and he's one of a very select group of people who have presented at each of our events having the grand slam of X-World, DevWorld, and CreateWorld. So the panel discussion today is going to be admin challenges for the... Oh, that's great. I've got a photo. <laughs> for the year ahead. For the year ahead. There we go. It Take it away. It wasn't that complex. It really was not that that's, complex. That's Carrie's fault. The drama is catching clearly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, as you can see, we do have a very full house. Um, so, uh, the nice thing is we've got a lot of time as well um, until uh, people need to head off and get to buses and, you know, run back to their hotel. By the way, my wife just tweeted uh, that um, there are people, sorry, there are cops um, on the corners just on, up here um, busting people for jaywalking. So if you are running back to your hotel, just be aware that there's some revenue raising happening outside our doors right now, so uh, make sure you cross only at the green lights. Um, but yeah, like I said, there, there is a very big panel here. Um, I'll let everyone just quickly go through and say who they are. I know there's only, a, there's only two microphones, so we're going to have to kind of do a bit of a handoff. But um, I'll start with James at the end there. Oh. And I don't know if they're on. All right, and we need some tech assistance just for two seconds to turn these mics on. Hi, my name's James. Uh, so I work for CultureAmp uh, down in Melbourne. Um, we're just a small company, 150 people. Um, and yeah, that's about it. We've been, I've been doing this for a couple of years now. Um, it's fun stuff. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> my name's Ben Greiner. I'm with Forget Computers out of Chicago, Illinois. And we have uh, 11 people and one robot on our team. That's how we talk about it. And uh, I'm worried. <laughs> and thank you very much for having me. Uh, Joel Rennick. Um, I should come up with something funny. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, Austin, Texas. Woo! <laughs> uh, no one here from Austin. That's fine. Hi, John Rhodes. Uh, I probably just heard my bio before, so I'll pass it on. <laughs> Um, I'm Bart Reardon. I work with the CSIRO down in Canberra. Um, we're a fairly major window shop, but we look after about 750-ish Max at the moment. So. I'm Carrie Irvine. I work for North Tech and I'm the DEP Drama Lama. And I'm Cameron Kay. I work for UNSW Australia. Um, we manage predominantly Max. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 or 1600 at the moment, but we're also looking at doing iOS uh, as well. Yeah, and the um, the idea of this panel partly was, first of all, to get Cameron up on stage because he's, he's he can be a grumpy lad, and so I, I didn't want to put him up on stage uh, for a proper presentation, but I did want to pick his brains in front of a room. Um, and so I thought that would be good. So this is kind of off the record. There is a camera at the back, and we are all mic'd up, but we're, we're going to go through, and if, if things are said on this panel that maybe you don't want um, shared later, just let us know, and this one doesn't have to go live. Um, but yeah, I just thought... First of all, so the nice mix here of education, corporate, of uh, open source tools, and as well as Jamf. So I thought that was a really nice mix as well. But I thought we'd start with some of the announcements um, that Apple just had from WWDC. So it was a pretty big announcement. Um, now, I know some people always freak out about talking about um, the software uh, that is still under NDA. Apple have changed the, their rules slightly. I, I do, um, as uh, Marcus mentioned, I, I do write for a paper. Apple have promised me that anything that they say on stage is no longer under NDA and you can talk about. So interpret that as you will. Um, but, I, but I think we're fairly safe to talk about any of the stuff that's come out and anything especially in the public beta I'm allowed to talk about, at least as a journalist, I would hope you guys are allowed to talk about as well. Um, so yeah, so just talk, talking about some of, the, some of the stuff we saw at WWDC. Now, the last couple of years, every time Apple have had a WWDC, there have been rumours beforehand swirling around that like, this is the year that Mac becomes, the Mac OS becomes kind of iOS, it's going to be locked down and you're not going to be do, able to do anything and all our, our jobs are redundant. And, um, and imaging is dead, which it has been for years, but imaging is really dead this time. <laughs> um, so again, that didn't happen this year, um, but is that something that is kind of 
terrifying people? Well, well, before we get into the nuts and bolts of actually what was announced, what do you guys feel about that kind of statement? Cameron, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, a lot of it looks pretty much uh, business as usual for, for the next 12 months, I think, in terms of, you know, is imaging dead or not? It looks like it's still going to be there, assuming it's not... To, there's a, there, there aren't any bug issues that which have sort of inflicted us for the last 12 months where, you know, you get one release of 10, 12 and it's working and the next one it doesn't sort of thing. So uh, hopefully that, sh that, that should be there. Um, you can see that they're um, pushing the configuration profiles and the MDM solution as, as the way forward, but they haven't had time to sort of do it all yet. So um, yeah, I suspect next year is going to be in a very exciting year, but in the meantime, <laughs> <laughs> it, it will be business as usual, except for the fact that we've got a new file system to deal with and, and what impacts that has on imaging, we don't know yet because that's, that stuff's not actually... Um, uh, in the current betas to actually test. Does anyone want to talk about uh, APFS and, and what they think that that will bring to the next year of Mac support? <coughs> Someone's got a mic. Snapshots. Oh, we can't wait for them. Um, as far as I'm concerned, anything that uh, lets me take a, 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 a picture of the machine as it is, do a thing, and if that fails, just go boom straight back again. Like I can just see. You know, that opens up a whole different sort of style of, of management that, uh, that sort of hasn't really been, you know, available without sort of some sort of serious, you know, injections into the OS. So to have it there native, is, I think, is really good. Anyone else? Anyone terrified of the idea of uh, their entire fleet moving over to APFS? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention, when I started doing this in 1998, Apple was predicted to go out of business. So compared to that, <laughs> I, I don't really worry about what might happen because I figure we'll all adapt and we'll all overcome and we'll all figure it out. The, the other thing that I'd like to, and we haven't chatted about this, and there hasn't been too much in the beta, or beta, as, as, a, as I should say. <laughs> um, that's something you eat. Um, Hmm. Although you put it on hamburgers, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I thought I remembered that. Um, anyway, back on topic. I think the, the, the most interesting thing to me, Snapshot's definitely very, very cool. And I think that's actually going to bring a whole new level to imaging that we didn't have before that may even end up being faster by the time it's done. Um, I'm very intrigued by the encryption possibilities. Um, I think we often forget that every single iOS device in the last six years has been encrypted out of the box. And that's one of the reasons why imaging may be a lot harder, because every single Mac may be encrypted coming from the factory at some point in time. Uh, but I am very, very intrigued by that, because that does add another level of protection to the user. I mean, how many of you in your fleets have to worry about, did File Vault get turned on? Did the keys get escrowed? All these other things. And so by understanding by default that it's going to be in there similar to the iOS devices, I'm very excited about. Cool. Um, I just wanted to go back to the MDM thing. Um, with the managed preferences, which is the biggest thing when you're moving to MDM, is letting go of those managed preferences. There's actually a really cool tool called MCX to Profile. If you Google that, um, it will save your life. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. And but but back to that idea though that like you know that the Apple Apple will eventually lock down the Max. Um, do, do we I didn't say that. No no no. I know you didn't say that. I'm not putting that on you. <laughs> but I'm just just wondering like do, do we do we think this is just an inevitability like over over time? Is this no anyone? You, you're seeing it in other parts of Mac OS where they're trying to simplify things. Uh, you know. I mean, it started the day that they started to hide the drive icons on the, the Finder desktop, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, because uh, they've, they've gone on for many years that things like the file system were very confusing for the Hiding users, the library, so, 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 the so get rid of it and stuff so that, that you, uh, you know, it doesn't confuse the user. And I guess now with iOS 11 with the, the new file, what's it called, the file browser or... Uh, yeah. Files app. Yeah, the files app. They've sort of brought some of that back, but in a controlled way. I mean, it's conceivable they'll bring that to the Mac at some point as well, just just to, some, to tidy up the Finder, because the Finder hasn't had any work for, for donkeys, really, except for the, 
the, the cocoa port about three or four years ago. So it, it's consistent what, what, what else they're doing to try, try that, you know, even when Steve Jobs was still doing the keynotes at WWDC, the, the last one with the iClap one, they said they're demoting the Mac to just another device. So it, it's not as special as it used to be. So it should be managed similarly. And I guess, you know, that, so that's, it's a, I suspect it's going to happen that, you know, it, it will be more locked down. But whether there's a power mode where you can turn it off, like, you know, this new mm -hmm. Windows 10S thing where you can promote it to the full version, or not, I don't know if they'll go to that extremes or not. But, you know, it's a bit like the old simple, simplified finder that they used to have for, for, for schools and stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. All right. Fair enough. I, right. I think it's important for us as power users and admins we oftentimes look at these kinds of things and like, well, they're taking stuff away from us. From Certainly from my time at Apple, and I wasn't in these groups, but I, I don't think there's anyone at Apple that's thinking, how can we piss these people off? <laughs> I, it, it, it feels mm -hmm. that way sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know it, it's a whack-a-mole kind of operation with the security side in that, you know, and you look at all the, the various Trojans and other things that are out there, and they're getting very, very sneaky. And there's... There's definitely a usability or at least a functionality from a power user perspective that has to be removed to kind of limit some of the uh, impact of those. Um, and I think that's the, the careful, the knife edge that we're on as we're here. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about the hardware stuff that was announced then? Um, I, I know this is not really uh, something that XWorld covers all that much, but um, I was fascinated, fascinated by some of the hardware. And I think we might see the iMac Pros actually coming into our space a little bit. Uh, does anyone see a need for those, or, uh, or what about those cool little breakout boxes for the uh, um, uh, the MacBook Pros? Anyone at all? Just be a nerd for a second, yeah. no doubt. Um, yeah, I think those breakout boxes are great. Um, as far as I can tell, they're just off the shelf. I think Sonnet boxes that ship with a GPU in them, but the ability to have your users. Um, uh, when you've got an environment where you might you can't decide between uh, do I want a desktop and I'm locked down to my desk or a workforce that is predominantly on the go moving around all the time being able to split the difference and give them a you know a 12 inch or a 13 inch MacBook Pro and then at the desk they've got this breakout box for when they do need to do those intensive tasks um, it makes it a bit easier rather than saying hey here's an iMac here's a small MacBook and now keep your stuff in sync yourself and try to do it um, from that way. So, you know, I'd love one of those boxes. Um, <laughs> get me multiple um, 5K screens off a small little laptop when I'm at the desk, but then also be able to move around, um, especially uh, for myself and where we work. Uh, people are constantly moving around, whether they're going into meeting rooms, off um, site to clients. Um, so having a larger screen at your desk and then still being able to move around is great. Uh, can I have a show of hands of education, people who work in education? Holy crap. Okay. Um, uh, so the keyboards, the wired keyboards as an option going away. That's easy. You just need to get the new keyboards and you glue the lightning connector in t into the back. That, that'll work, <laughs> won't it? Hmm, right, yes. right. That's, yeah, that's our one way. Then we have to get the budget to cover the glue. So... <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, um, honestly, wireless keyboards are just never going to work in a lab environment. You'd have to have someone actually looking after them, charging them, stopping people from stealing cables and keyboards and mice. It's just never going to work, yeah. I'm just trying to find it. There was on the, uh, the Slack channel, there was, I think it was a post, one of the third-party keyboard companies were actually going to ramp up production of their wired keyboards, <laughs> specifically to answer this problem. Yeah. yeah. Macau, Macau, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that'll be interesting to see, you know, if these sort of it opens up opportunities for these uh, for third parties to just to come mm. in and fill those gaps. Yeah, I think one of the, I mean, this seems like uh, one of those dis decisions that aren't going to be reversed. But I would I would say like if you do uh, if you can complain to Apple either file file a radar or whatever. But just um, I, I know one of the options I heard um, whispered was maybe. You could buy a version that just doesn't have the keyboard or mouse in it. So, you know, they're not going to continue to sell the wired versions of the keyboard or mouse. But if you could then get an iMac that doesn't have a keyboard or mouse in the box, that could actually be half decent at least. And then you could just buy whatever piece of crap you wanted. Um, 
Sorry, were you going to? Well, I was going to say that we've just done that. We've gone out and bought uh, 50 of the new iMacs the other day, and we had to go off to Amazon and order 50 of the Mac Alley keyboards and mice. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> what did you do with the wife? Uh, because they're leased, we have to stick them in a cupboard because they have to be returned with the machines at the end of three years. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's the issue there, is that you're still paying for the wireless keyboard and yeah. mouse, and in education you just don't have that money, I'm afraid. Mm. What about the, uh, the laptops themselves? There, there's still not a decent dock out there, I think, for the laptops. Like, the Apple's range of dongles, considering how central to living with a Mac is a dongle these days, they don't make a decent one, I don't think. Um, it, it's a pain in the butt. Like, I, I wish they would just make one kind of nice... Just USB, Ethernet, and, and a display of some type, and that would be it connected to USB-C. Um, does, anyone, does anyone know of a decent dock out there? Um, Which one? Oh, the Huawei. Huawei? Yeah, yeah. yeah right. OK, cool. Um. Oh, they did? Yeah, I, I saw their Thunderbolt one. It's bloody expensive as hell, but so if there's a... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I have just got a demo unit of the Targus one in as well. Um, yeah. It is pretty good, but it does have limitations around which graphics chipsets it supports for different outputs. So do make sure you either get a demo unit to test or um, triple check the specs before you buy, because they're not cheap. Um, just on, you know, you go. I was just going to say, we, we've been buying... Um, Dell, USB-C ones, and they've been working fantastically well, and it's great because we just need one device for whether it's a Mac or a PC, mm. yeah. um, and they've got a, a nice little portable one for about 70 bucks, uh, and then a, a bigger dock for about 200. And Yeah, we're playing with those at the moment, but yeah, we just still haven't kind of, we haven't found one that we just love, that we want to be able to, like the, the, we want to just get one that we could stick on every desk, you know, that yeah. you could well, recommend. I'm finding it very what? frustrating because you know, this is adding two hundred, three hundred dollars onto a Mac, which for Australians is becoming so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm losing people to PCs because when we put a quote in front of them, you know, the Dell Latitude with a touch screen and <coughs> Retina sort of uh, resolution plus it has an Ethernet port and an HDMI port. Yeah, it's like, well, what do we need on the Mac that I can't get on the Dell, and it's a thousand dollars cheaper. Yeah, the Elite book is bloody nice, and it's yeah, it's <laughs> half the price. Anyway, it, it's a shame that uh, the Microsoft Surface still uses the Surface connector and not USB-C, because some of their docks are quite nice too. And if we could just use those, mm. we'd be sweet as well. I was going to touch on the the idea that um, you know Macs are becoming more expensive. Um, uh, you know, that, that that has long been the criticism that the Macs are far more expensive or overpriced compared to to the PC, and for a long time I thought you could you know, easily make the argument against it, and you know, that's what I've bloody done for 10 years of my career. Um, but today it seems harder to make that, that um, argument. I, I think so, and you know, with the, the touch bar, it's a feature that nobody asks for. It's, it's nice, it's fun, yeah. I think people enjoy it, but mm. if you could knock $150, $200 off for not having it, I'd I think most people would probably rather well, it's do it's more that. like 300 off. It, yeah. That's basically the, the, when they re released the 2016 model, they were in the US, they were about $300 more than the top of the line previous generation. So, you know, that's, that's the premium you're paying for basically uh, an Apple Watch in your keyboard. Yeah. I should have asked if uh, anyone from Apple was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. We love, we love. I mean, we're coming from a place of love, but, but you know, sometimes you... Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say on the touch bar, maybe I'm biased, but I actually enjoy the touch bar. Um, not... We found him. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, I'm the one. But not the touch bar that you get out of the box. Um, there's a great utility called Better Touch Tool. It's really great for remapping uh, your keys, uh, adding extra gestures. They've also added support for the touch bar where you can... Um, constantly have uh, your own defined shortcuts, buttons, whatever you want on the touch bar and it displays over any app and it also can change based on whatever modifiers uh, you're using. So uh, for me personally, having that app with the touch bar, it's great because I can really customise it but I'm just one of those people who does that. Um, yeah. Uh, just to add to that, 
going back to the price, we all know IBM says they're cheaper, right? Mm. So do they now need to revamp that, you think, based on this bar that we're talking about? Or Well, that's the first thing I thought when I saw the keynote. <laughs> well, it is tough, right? Because uh, I, I, the conversion to Australian probably will even make this argument even more solid. But mm. in the US, it's hard. We used to do a lot of sales with the 13-inch MacBook Pro because that seemed corporate. You know, the air was nice, but it seemed a little loose at times and maybe mm. not as powerful. But the 13-inch MacBook Pro with had an entry price of around 1000 1200 was really nice. Mm. And now that's up to 1400 yeah. uh, and that's before you even get to the touch bar. Um, and that becomes a, a pretty significant hurdle. Yeah, I think that's the issue, um, is that the, the MacBook, the, I, the new version of the MacBook, the MacBook's adorable, the USB-C one, um, the retina, whatever, whatever, you know, everyone calls it a different thing. But um, yeah, like th that is still so expensive for, for what it is. It's, it's a much better machine this time around. Um, but yeah, it's still, the, there doesn't seem to be anything that low end except for the air, which I'm sure everyone on this. Which feels like it's been forgotten. Yeah, which you don't want to recommend the air to anyone at this point. Can I just raise a point, though, that mm. the iPad is sort of moving into that space? Mm. Yeah. And that's possibly why? Mm. Yeah, I don't know about that either. Like, I mean, I, 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 was, I was really surprised that there weren't enough people talking about how expensive the iPad Pro was um, in their reviews, because I had to read them all and collate them. And then I realised, yeah, in America, it's like 600 bucks for an iPad Pro. That's awesome. Um, here, it's just over 1000 so, um, well, sorry, just under a thousand. Take orders you the get next time. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bring them over. <laughs> I get them for free. It's fine. Um, <laughs> actually, look, we'll move on from pricing. Um, and Ben, I wanted to uh, discuss something you brought up in your talk. Um, one of the things we've struggled with in our environment is the idea. We've been using Jamf now for about eighteen months, I'd say, <clears throat> maybe longer. Um, we we still struggle a little bit with our support staff. Um, really embracing it, I would say, or, or embracing the self-service model. I think there's still a bit of a fear out there that self-service means their job is going away one day. Um, how, how do you address that kind of concern? I mean, it seems like something that you've, you've kind of, you, you touched on during your talk. Uh, yeah, I think even in our own environment, which is relatively small, we're talking about a dozen people, uh, making even small changes like using self-service uh, or back in the old days doing a remote session versus dispatching someone. Um, it's just continually building that in and reminding people and saying, you know, hey, let's not go on site until we have a reason to go on site or, hey, did you know self-service is, is an option? And I constantly get frustrated frustrated uh, at my own team that we didn't communicate well enough to let them know that that is an option. So th th it does take time, it takes momentum, and it's something that you don't want to give up on because right when it feels like it's never going to work, something kicks in and then suddenly right. everyone's doing it and they're doing it better than you imagined and you're like, hey, this is great. Okay. Um, anyone else uh, got, got words of advice for, for an organization like us? Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been doing uh, self-service um, across the, the Macs and the Windows for a little while now. And one thing that I'll say is that that those tasks that so would have been done at a service desk level, there is plenty of work to fill the void. Mm. Um, there's, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much. Yeah. But, but I, I do see that. I see that fear of, well, if I'm not doing this, what will I be doing? And, and I think we all like to tinker and get our hands sort of dirty and, and asking the client or the person in front of the computer to run self-service feels a bit too easy. So I, I, can, I understand that and um, it, it can take a, a, a bit of work to change that outlook. Fair enough. John, um, you sound like you've got pretty smart users. Um, how, how do you convince a user who is curing cancer that you need to lock down their machine? <laughs> Uh, we're lucky it's history, um, so we, we, it's something that we've always done, uh, and I, I guess with the uh, Monkey and uh, JSS self-service, we sort of say, well, what do you need it for? Why do you actually need it? Well, I need to install this application, okay, well, we should have that in our catalogue. Um, 
I think the only time somebody had a really, really legitimate need is they went to a hotel in China and the Ethernet there was statically assigned. Literally, your room number was like the last octet of the IP address you had to put in. I was like, okay, fair enough. There was that one time that you really needed admin rights. <laughs> but I don't know, there just doesn't seem to be a pressing need. It comes up and when we get new staff who come from other places, they're like, well, what, I can't do it. But it seems to go away. It's a, I think it's easier than people might think to actually, if you, if you do want to remove admin rights from people, um, but you do have to make sure that you've got every single package about, uh, imaginable available yeah. for them to put in there. So there's a bit more work for you. Um, you know, VPP's made some of that easier, for sure, but, uh, and yeah, an auto package exactly, you just, you know, tick, 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 and bang, they're all there. So I, I think th those combined, you know, users shouldn't really be mucking around too much with the other system settings in there. You know, why would they turn on, you know, sharing and things like that? I don't know. It doesn't seem... We still treat it as an institute laptop rather than an individual's laptop, which, again, it's a different sort of, um, you know, a conceptual idea, I think. I mean, some of the challenges for us are things like home printers, where they require an admin password to install the software package and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's a bit awkward to second guess every, everybody's home printer or, or even some of the wacky Wi-Fi stuff in some people's places as well. Yeah, well, printers, we found that by making them a member of the LP admin group, they were able to uh, at least set up the printer. Drivers, uh, the, when it happens that you did have to install it, again, we've, we've had TeamViewer on our Macs, and so we, we generally say when you're at home, team, and we'll team for you and, and do it. Um, I guess if somebody really, really complained, we'd say, well, we support your work laptop for work. Home printing's nice, but ultimately, sorry. Full on. <laughs> you, don't have, uh, yeah, you don't have the Faculty of Arts to deal with, clearly. <laughs> I mean, we, we used to run with, with no admin accounts for a long time, especially on the desktop machines. And then when we moved to the the, the, um, the DEP self-service model, uh, basically we, we said, well, you, you, you're going to be setting the machine up yourself, so you'll be admin. And, and honestly, we haven't had any major security issues or any uh, huge stuff-ups because of it. I mean, not every environment's like ours. Ours is reasonably uh, free and open. But, yeah, you can understand for some businesses, they <coughs> legally they may require it to be without admin. Um, sorry, is it Carol? Carol? Uh, Carol or Carrie, either. Carol. Yeah. So, or Drama Llama. Or Drama Llama, <laughs> okay. So Drama Llama. Um, sorry, uh, how, how many users do you have in, in North Tech? Um, in North Tech, we have around 500 staff and around 3,500 students. So we're very small, but what it does mean is that we can kind of bump things along a bit faster, which is useful. Yeah. And so you've got 85 Apple TVs. Yes. Because we've got 70,000 users and three Apple TVs. You need more. <laughs> yeah, one of those is the VC. Yeah, one of those is purely a Netflix device. Um, so uh, so can, you, can, can you give me some kind of hope that we will might maybe one day get Apple TVs on our environment and our networking team will be fine with that? Um, potentially, yeah. There's, um, there's definitely changes to how locked down they are. I know network guys like to complain about the MDNS traffic um, with the broadcasting, which, um, yeah, but there's ways around that. You can um, section off ports um, for, for that, so, yeah. Fair enough. Anyone else actually have successful, like, Apple TV deployment in their area? I just want to hear, like, happy stories <laughs> to end the day. <laughs> we haven't actually, we haven't thought of it. Fair enough. I have two in my house, and they've worked very well. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the ones in the office were a little more touch and go. Fair enough. Just wondering, um, uh, is there any software that's caught your eye in the last uh, little while that you're, you're really excited to play with over the next year? Uh, I don't know if you'll find the time to do that, but is there... Uh, anything that's caught anyone's eye? I mean, John, uh, have you been using Jam for a while? Or? About six weeks, eight weeks. Well, there you go. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How's the experience? Oh, the installation was terrible. No, it's, <laughs> like, no, it's crazy. Um, it, it actually, it was pretty bad. Our sand died halfway through it, so <laughs> we spent most of the day on the phone. Oh, no, it was a, a VM. But anyway, it wasn't Daniel's fault. 
Oh, we need to jump start. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. Um, we, we still have both Monkey and uh, Jamf installed on the Macs, and it, Monkey does some things really, really well, and Jamf does some things in a weird way, which is perhaps a nice way of putting it, and you're like, why can't you just, if, so, if, if, if an installation fails, why don't you just reinstall it? Instead of having to flush the policies and lots of other things like that, and so, I think if we come from nothing to Jamf, we wouldn't be coming up with all of these things. But since we came from something, it was like, oh, why can't we have it the old way and the new way? But I think we probably had the quickest deployment of the um, Jamf agent onto, onto Mac in, in, in history because we, we literally just gave it to a monkey guy. He put it on there, unattended install, and I think within an hour we had about 90% of our Macs all polling back to JSS. So it was... Um, yeah, pretty easy, I think, compared to <laughs> most manual ways of doing it. Mm. So um, I'd, I'd say that VPP has just been amazing. I, I wish that we actually had more apps that we want from the App Store. I yeah. mean, this is the, the problem, that, that none of the things we use are there. Um, but I think remote desktop and um, oh, yeah, a couple of the Apple apps have been the only ones we've found. And actually going back to the original point about is the Mac becoming lock, more locked down, I'd say I reckon that the main reason it hasn't become more, uh, more locked down is that there just aren't the apps in the App Store that people want, yeah. which would, I think would allow Apple to turn the screws and to lock it down more. Uh, I, I do think that the App Store is really holding the platform back because it just doesn't have the apps <laughs> that people want in there. And it's, it's ruining our deployment. <laughs> mm. yeah, just imagine how much easier Adobe CC would be deployed if it could all be done via VPP. Yeah, and, and Office as well, you know. Mm. Um, and perish the thought something like Pro Tools ever be, becoming a friendly <laughs> VPP app. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I was really surprised. I thought we'd see like Office move into the Mac App Store as a kind of um, a thank you to Apple of the whole Windows S thing. And, you know, they're, they're the friend of my friend, you know, the whole, sorry, enemy, you know what it is, that thing. Um, but no, it didn't happen. It's a bummer. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think the one app that we need a session on, because I haven't figured out how to use it, is Apple Clips. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a teenager for that, don't you? <laughs> Actually, James did it yesterday. Yeah, I, I, co I covered that in the workshop yesterday morning. Uh, it's a great little tool. It's good for quick stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, apart from Clips, is there anything else that's caught your eye? Uh, maybe something in the management space that, uh, that looks really cool to play with. Oh. Anyone? I saw our arms go up. Oh, okay. Um, we're, I, I use mostly sort of open source and free software and stuff like that, mainly because it's open source and free. Um, but uh, I'm sort of less looking at, at, at sort of an individual app and sort of like it's a sort of collection of apps that will let me rethink the process that we use. So, you know, we're looking at, at using Nomad and, and questioning whether we need to join AD. Um, uh, I look at stuff like um, I think there was a uh, what's it called? It's called uh, Mac OS Laps. I don't know if you've used Laps before, but um, so basically it's just randomising your local admin passwords so rather than having that you know one admin account, same password. There's a security hole. You randomise the password per machine. You store that in an AD object, and you know if you need it, then you have to go to AD and get it. Um, so you know, can we use that with you know, do we have to join the domain to do that? Needs an object, I guess. But so we're so sort of, we're sort of looking at, at at these kind of things, and it's it, it, it's um it makes me sort of question how we currently do things. And the thing I'm most excited for is is sort of progressing um, you know, those platforms, so that you know next year when you know ten fourteen comes out and we're not stuck and going oh crap I haven't. Yeah, Apple's stopped me from doing this thing that I've been doing for the last five years. Mm. All right. um, I've only got one question left. So if people uh, in the audience have a question, um, we might uh, get one of the mics to start roving around the room. So if Marcus is around, there he is. I see him sneaking up now. Um, so the only other question I have is, um, in our space, I think self-service has kind of gotten most of what we need, um, apart from the Mac app store sucking. Yes, fair enough. Um, except for... Uh, migration of user data it seems to be the last kind of hurdle that we have. Like our experience for a brand new user is fantastic, out of the box, great, there you go, you're happy. 
for a user who's been around forever and has um, a lot of data that needs to be migrated across, we just don't really have a good uh, tool or experience for them. I mean, we have a decent experience. They get a lovely person coming to their desk. But um, we don't actually have a tool in our self-service catalog that we can tell them um, to use at this stage. Does anyone here have any? Uh, I'll start with everyone on the, the, um, the platform first. Uh, but does anyone here have a, a good solution that they're using right now for migration of user data? You have one for Windows, yes? Sorry, where's the other mic? Oh, sorry, there's one. Oh. Oh. Yeah, so we've got one for Windows. So we, we take a, you know, you can take a, 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 web, a system image of the machine, store that on the network, you get your new machine, and you dump all the stuff back again. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got that. Um, conceptually, for the Mac side, I have thought about and I've actually written, you know, tools to do that. Um, one way I haven't, so I can do the backup. I haven't written the other way yet. So yeah, right. Um, but you know, conceptually, it's sort of like doable, but it's I haven't really thought of it. But it's really it's just you know taking uh, an image of your drive, dumping it on the network, and then mounting that and copying everything back. But uh, I get my users to do it. Um, so <laughs> I, I basically, when they're up for a new computer, I I tell them. Go and download a trial of Carbon Copy Cloner. Here's your new Mac. Um, clone, <laughs> cl clone your drive to your new computer. Boot it up. Uh, go and re-enroll yourself in the JSS, and then the kind of my enrollment workflow takes over, which is what new users see. Um, and and then they give me their old computer. And a couple of days later, I wipe their old computer. Uh, once they've said yes, uh, everything's on my new one, and off they go. I'd, I'd love a more automated way, or maybe it's just a case of um, instructing people to always store your stuff in cloud services, but people aren't really going to listen. Users don't really listen to you. Um, yeah, that's how I handle it. I'm, I'm sure I'm an anomaly, but I like starting fresh. Um, the last thing I want to do is copy over because I've got so much crud. It's just built. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and I keep everything. I never delete email. I never listen to voicemail. I never delete email. Um, I don't delete chats. So I usually find I can recover most of my collective thoughts uh, from, from just that. Mm. But then it's nice. I always like, you know, like a home folder that doesn't have a variety of randomly named folders in it that mm. I've forgotten what they were for. So I think it's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I've, I keep all my crap in OneDrive now just because that's, we've got an Office 365 account at, at work. So um, I have m moved my stuff there, but um, we haven't even tried to convince our users to start doing that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear there's some um, uh, angst around this because we continually try to find what's the best way to consistently migrate someone, and we've tried everything, including building our own self-service migration tool. And they always seem to work just long enough, and then Apple changes something, or there's a new hardware, or there's a new OS, and then we have to rework it. And I'd rather someone else do that than us spend time doing that. And, and migration assistance seems to work, but then we fight over, well, sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. We don't know how long it's going to take, and that hurts the user experience, because we didn't set the expectations correctly. Uh, so it is a real struggle, and to piggyback off that, one of the things I, I wish Apple would do is give us a little more uh, of a, a runway when it comes to new OS and new hardware. Uh, because we have installations out there, uh, we have plans and procedures, and then suddenly the OS drops, it's free, we, we try to <laughs> stop it you know, long enough that we can get ready for it. I love the zero day concept, but out in the wild when you're dealing with 100 different clients, it just, you can't do it, at least not yet. And then there's the issue of you, you, you want a new Mac that you had planned on buying next week, but now that Mac's not available. And the only one that is available is running the new OS. And then, you know, people get really upset about this. In the Windows world, they don't understand it because they're like, <laughs> well, Dell told us like six months ago yeah, yeah. that we were going to be doing this. Didn't Apple tell you this? Like, no, Apple didn't tell us anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a certified uh, Final Cut server installer, so yeah. there we go. Yeah. I, I got my certification two days before they killed that product. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I find it interesting. Um, maybe we're a bit more old school, or I'm a proper evil IT overlord. But the concept of local user data what, doesn't. People might move their bookmarks, but <laughs> everything's on network shares or, or OneDrive. And you know, if somebody's got data on a laptop. If it's data that the organisation is interested in, it, it's a disaster. It's unprotected. It needs to be needs to be some sort of backup solution or a syncing or. You know, if you can't use own cloud or Dropbox, you set up your own uh, sorry, your own cloud or, or OneDrive. Um, you know, literally, we, we have a new computer comes out and somebody says, "Oh, okay, um, thanks," and they just take the old one and so sort of take the new one and the old one it doesn't matter. There's nothing on in there anyway. Um, but I guess it's user training again, and um, the the various labs demand that their staff store the data in the right sort of place. Uh, and, and also, a lot of our data is so big anyway that it kind of has to be on a, on a network share. So it's sort of largely irrelevant. But um, yeah, there's very little. I've, I've never once used Migration Assistant in seven years or, or even manually done anything close to that. So quite, quite lucky, I guess. <laughs> Um, I was going to say it it's, it's definitely comes down to user education and, and, and treating their laptop like or their desktop like a thing that if it disappeared today, we need to be able to give you a thing that and you can just keep on going. But um, you know we try to do that and we try to train our users. You know, store your stuff on the network shares. You know, all that sort of crap. But it's it's kind of uh, you know uh, rainbow unicorn land. You know, if you think that uh, someone's not going to lose three months' worth of research because their laptop got run over by a car and they're like, can you help me out? And like, yeah, we'll just get your backups. You've got backups, don't you? Time Machine's been a really good thing for sort of helping to mitigate some of that, but we've also got, you know, restrictions around what people can use. Yeah, right. So. We certainly encourage the use of things like CrashPlan or one of the other cloud backup software solutions as well because... Um, not everybody remembers to put their file in the Dropbox or the OneDrive folder or, I, or, or iCloud. I mean, I, I certainly use those myself and I find it very handy for when you're setting up a new machine. All you simply have to do is log it in back into your credentials and it all comes back down. And also with things like the iCloud Drive now where it's got that um, stub system where by default it doesn't bring anything down and you've got to click on them. That means, means you know, you don't fill up your hard drive automatically but you can get the stuff you want. And I, I believe OneDrive and and uh, Dropbox are going to implement that same sort of thing on the Mac eventually as well. I mean, they effectively have that on iOS now. So, so Carol, um, the, that, the Mac that sits under the tarpaulin somewhere in New Zealand, how, how does that get migrated? Ah, um, uh, that's actually a class of iPads. Oh, right. So um, <laughs> we've just migrated the way that we're using devices, um, but it means that we can have a classroom literally in the bush. So, yeah. All right, do we have any questions from the audience before we wrap it up? Yep. Um, sorry. Hello. Um, so I work in an environment where we've got 5 volt um, on, on all laptops and we also have the local admin account and I'm currently working on a workflow where the um, profile to enable 5 volt um, gets uh, triggered at first login for the for the customer, the end user, and then a pop up that just asks them to put in their password again, to then enable our local tech account to have um, to be FileVault enabled. I was wondering if anyone was doing anything um, better than that, or <laughs> have had any innovative solutions to to this. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I handle that um, all through Jamf myself. Um, so as part of the DP workflow, and I'll speak about it tomorrow. Um, one of the, one of the things that happens during that is uh, there's a policy that comes down that enables um, File Vault uh, for next login. Um, as part of that, um, keys are set to escrow in the JSS, and the final part of the enrollment um, will force the user to log out. They got to log back in. They can't log in unless they turn on FileVault. Um, and then there are follow-on policies which are set to enable the management account for, um, for FileVault. The only downside of that is then when a if a user uh, reboots their machine, they're going to see your management account 
as one of the options. You can't hi you can hide it from the regular user screen. You can't hide it from the file vault screen. But that way, they're not prompted um, to put in their password to enable that account. Jamf kind of takes care of enabling that extra account. And I'm also running another policy if for some reason that key gets messed up or changes, um, they get a pop-up to put in their password to cycle the keys so that it gets the correct key gets um, escrowed back into the JSS. Uh, yeah, we're also using Jamf in a workflow similar, uh, without although without DEP, and I could put you in contact with our team on how that's done because I don't really know the nitty gritty details other than we had to work through some things to make it work. Um, I did want to go back to storage and cloud storage because uh, you know, Apple is now enabling uh, cloud storage for desktops and documents folder. Um, is anyone using that? And is anyone con concerned about that or how they might turn that off when it becomes default? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, we, we definitely don't use it at our organization. Um, it's, well, we don't encourage them, yes, yeah. It's a good question. Sorry, does anyone leave it on? Does anyone leave desktop and de uh, documents? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, you know, I have to be honest. I've been I've been using it, and it has been so nice when I go to my iPad to just grab something because it's right there. Does it still do that weird thing where, like, if you've got two Macs, one of them is, is called like desktop subfolder, other uh, Mac. I don't know. I I just have one Mac. All right, so. it still does. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know, I know. But. Yeah, I've got a desktop and I'm lucky enough to have a desktop and a laptop, so that feature is great because it enables me to go between my two devices and stuff is always in sync. Um, and it saved me the other day. I was out and like, oh, crap, I forgot to email that file to myself and I was at Officeworks trying to print something. I'm like, oh, no, it's in my – it was on my desktop. So, okay, just load up the app on my iPhone iCloud Drive, desktop, oh, sweet, there it is, perfect. I um, haven't really thought about it from a perspective of uh, kind of corporate data being synced through iCloud, even though we're not, that's not our storage provider of choice. Um, I imagine one day I'll have a conversation with my security team and they'll go, you've got to turn this off now, but that conversation hasn't happened yet, so I'm just kind of not, not bringing it up. Um, yeah. Um, I'm in the same yes. boat. I, <laughs> I use it personally and um, it is really convenient, um, definitely, but at the same time I couldn't roll that out to my users, it would just be unmanageable. And um, as an admin, something to watch out for is do not package Creative Cloud apps to your desktop, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the considerations, because uh, we're sort of a semi-government um, organisations, so we're funded by the government, so we've still got those restrictions about uh, where your data, your cloud data can be stored. So we've gone through a process with uh, with Microsoft for Office 365 and all that stuff. We haven't been able to roll that out because the data centres are in Singapore and there's, you know, IP export restrictions and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's all sorted out now from that side, from the mm. Apple side. You put it in the cloud and it's like, it's... It's where it's, it's in the cloud. It's in the cloud, <laughs> but you know, there's sort of like there's border restrictions that we have to sort of consider um, for those. So it, it'd be really nice to be able to sort of turn that on for our users. Mm. Um, but it's yeah, so Microsoft logistics problem does now have servers down in uh, Alexandria, so we, we're using yeah. them now, and that's fine. They've got Melbourne and I think the Sydney ones. I think are yeah. opening up. Yeah. And this will be the last comment. I've um, talked to the OneDrive people at Microsoft about whether they plan to do a desktop and documents thing, and they're, they're keen to try and do it. They're not sure if they can yet. So I guess eventually you should be able to do a policy to turn the Apple one off and be able to turn, you know, your cloud sync vendor of choices one on, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. that would be awesome. Uh, well, more um, off-the-record uh, answers to the questions we were asked today will be uh, featured in about, I don't know, three hours after the beers have been drunk uh, at the dinner. So uh, please feel free to uh, go up to any of the people on the panel and ask some questions later tonight. Thank you, everyone on the panel, for joining us today. And thank you, Pete, for convening the panel. That was great.